Hey, this is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I'm back on the show with my wife, Adi Cashew, CEO and founder of Working Against Gravity. Adi has worked with dozens of CrossFit Games athletes like Katrin Davidsdaughter, Camille leblanc Bazinet, Brooke Entz, Brooke Wells, and many, many more. They, her team has also worked with over 15,000 people, uh, helping them to transform their bodies and their entire lives. On this one, we talk about things like mindset, why having structure around your nutrition is important, uh, the most common challenges and situations that derail people and what you can do about them. We talk about why taking action is more important than understanding why you behave a certain way and some other really cool things, uh, different models like the A to B model. This one is just packed full of little nuggets of wisdom. As always, I hope you enjoy the show. If you've got a question about health and fitness, mindset, or even life in general that you'd like me or one of my guests to answer, I'd love to hear from you. To do so, call into the Brute Hotline at 801-449-0503. Talk to you soon. Hey, this is Mike Cashew. You're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. I'm back for the third or fourth time, I believe, with my wife, Adi Cashew. Mm -hmm. Adi, I'm excited to do this one with you. <laughs> Third time, I think. Yeah. Maybe fourth time. I'm excited and nervous. So, most of the listeners already know who you are, know you know what your company is or does. But for those who don't, can you explain briefly what your company is all about and even uh, what flexible dieting is? So, I'll start with flexible dieting. So, uh, flexible dieting is essentially. Uh, instead of tracking calories for your diet, you're going to be tracking macronutrients. So you're going to be tracking how many carbs, fats, and proteins you eat in a day and uh, working through how to meet those requirements. That's what flexible dieting is. And what Working Against Gravity does is we focus on using the principles of flexible dieting to facilitate some type of transformation, whether that's a physical transformation, an emotional transformation, a mental transformation, whatever it is, uh, we use nutrition as our vehicle to uh, change whatever it is that you're trying to change or achieve any goal that you're trying to achieve. So when you're having a conversation with people, whether it be uh, one of our friends or family members or just someone you meet, you rarely talk about the macro portion of what you guys do. Why is that and, and what you know, what is the most important thing, I guess? I think that the, the macro part of what we do is not what's actually making that transformation happen. Uh, and the most important part to me and what I've seen through experience to help people the most is the other aspects, the behavior, the things that you're saying to yourself, your anxieties around food, the uncertainties around food, uh, how to feel confident in making the right food choices or how to navigate certain uh, social situations or being around certain people. Focusing on just the macros themselves uh, puts you kind of in this almost like an unflexible scenario. Like I have to just focus on these things where there's so many other things that come into play. So how did you, how did you learn that? Because your experience when you were a teenager was with another macro coach. So what was that like and kind of what, what was the um, situation or what happened that taught you that, what you just said? I don't know if that, if working with the other coach helped me learn that. Uh, I think that what helped me learn that was, was seeing all of my insecurities and all of my, uh, you know, confidence robbers or the things that were robbing me of confidence around food. And then once I started coaching people myself, seeing how consistent that was across so many different people from all different walks of life, whatever gender you are, however old you are, everyone's still, whether you're an elite athlete or you're not an elite athlete, these people are all suffering from the same things. Uh, and the same insecurities. And that's when I took a serious interest in making that the primary focus of our program. What were some of those confidence robbers, as you call them? Confidence robbers for me? Mm -hmm. uh, confidence robbers for me was not feeling like I had control when I could eat 
things that would be considered bad or what people would consider an indulgence. So I didn't feel like I could have some and not all. I would have this mentality of, of this is my, I'm Cinderella at the ball. You've heard me say that before. Like, this is my only night. I'm Cinderella at the ball. Tomorrow I turn back into a pumpkin and I'm not going to be able to eat sweets ever again. And that was a huge confidence robber for me. Um, another one was competing in a weight class specific sport, having this like anxiety around making weight, like not knowing how much I could eat or how much was too little that would sacrifice my performance. Being an athlete, like it was, I knew nutrition was super important to optimize my, my performance, but I wasn't confident in making the right food choices. And especially when you're in a weight class specific sport and you have to lose weight, uh, I didn't want to under eat and then show up on game day not able to perform. So those were two huge confidence robbers for me. One thing that I hear a lot from our friends and family and people that we meet is that people that have never tried flexible dieting before, they say something to the effect, oh my God, that's so strict. How can you ever like weigh and measure all of your yeah. food? Like you're crazy. How do you deal with that um, objection to flexible dieting? Um, I think I don't think that there's any single nutrition program out there that doesn't have some level of restriction. If it doesn't have some level of restriction, it's going to be impossible for you to see progress. Like there has to be some type of restriction. Uh, for me, I find this the least level of restriction for me. But the way that I like to think about it is that this is a set of skills that you're learning and the beginning of anything is difficult. So I compare it to something like weightlifting where it's a super technical sport. It's a super technical movement. It requires a lot of brain energy to focus on all the cues that you're learning, you know, full extension, pull under the bar, drop under the bar, uh, jump your feet outside, like whatever it is that your coach is telling you, you're focusing at the beginning of learning how to snatch with just an empty bar. You're focusing on all of those cues at the same time. And I've seen people miss snatches with empty bars that are like, can snatch a hundred kilos, but just because of the mental fortitude it requires to learn something. And that's the same with nutrition. And that's why you have to, in weightlifting, use the broomstick, learn the technique so that eventually when you do get the heavy weight on the bar and things actually get really difficult, all of those little nuances become automatic and they don't take as much brain energy. But you have to you have to suffer through the beginning. Like right. it's going to be difficult. You have to spend the time weighing and measuring so that later on you have the knowledge to do to to make good decisions wherever you are. Right. And I think that a huge thing and why this is so popular is we live in a world now where food is super accessible. You can get food for really cheap. You can get super calorie dense food and living in America, there's serving sizes that are absolutely enormous. You're going to restaurants and you can easily overeat. So not seeing what a serving size actually looks like, you know, you don't know. So this just teaches you those types of skills like what are you actually eating and of course it's going to take work mm -hmm. it's going to it's going to be difficult we've never said that this was easy it's hard it takes a lot of work but eventually it does get easier and it becomes more automatic and you can feel confident not weighing and measuring your food because you've done it so many times. It's like you're confident when you pick up the bar to do a snatch when you've been weightlifting for a couple years. Like I don't really have to think about the every single little technique cue when I'm snatching with just the bar. I can mm -hmm. focus on just warming up and moving my body and be confident that I'm not going to hurt myself. Uh, it's the same thing with nutrition. And it's this is literally, as far as nutrition is concerned, this is literally the... Um, the concept of discipline equals freedom, right? Mm -hmm. A lot. One of the objections people have have is that it's too much. It's too too structured, right? We like I don't have enough freedom in this in this model. But in fact, by by knowing how many carbs, fats, and proteins you have to eat, you have infinite flexibility on how you meet those those goals, right? Right. And and you always talk about like people think they want. They want freedom, but they don't really know what that is, right? They need some structure mm -hmm. to have that freedom. Yeah, I mean, people think they want freedom, but you really do want structure. But people just don't realize that what they want is structure. It's, just, mm -hmm. it's like you and I go to a restaurant. We've, we, Michael and I have done this so many times. We go to a restaurant, you go to the Cheesecake Factory, and there's like 
40 different entree options. It's overwhelming. I don't really want that much freedom. I kind of want you to like bring it down a little bit and only present me, you know, the best options mm-hmm. or don't give me so much so much decision making mm-hmm. power. I I want some type of structure. A lot of people feel that way as well. And, you know, I love going to a restaurant that has one page menu because right. I'm like, oh, I, I'm not going to have to spend 25 minutes to try to figure out what it is that I'm going to eat and fear of missing out on the best meal on the menu. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you have to get like six things. <laughs> no. Um, totally lost my train of thought. I had, a, I had something to add to that. I think what people, th- what people think they want is no boundaries, right? But when, what those boundaries, the structure that this a system like this puts in place or even just like uh, putting some structure around your daily schedule, right? Creating some boundaries around your schedule, it, cre- it allows you to have freedom within those, that structure. But when you have no boundaries, then you're, I don't know, you get distracted very easily. You and make you, poor decisions. And it's hard for you to make progress. It's like you're on a road and you're headed towards the goal. Mm-hmm. If you don't have... You know, if you have a bunch of exits along the way with a bunch of signs saying, you know, the world's largest dinosaur, or the world's largest apple, you're going to stop along the way and keep checking out these I would things. never stop for eating. Whatever, <laughs> Whatever it is, apple. like all these side attractions that pull you off the road, it's going to make it a way longer trip for you to get to the end of the road, whichever the goal is. So having some structure and some boundaries to not be able to get off at those exits is going to be your fastest path to progress, which sticking to your macros 100% is going to be the fastest path to progress. Being a little bit lenient with it is totally possible and something that we definitely promote as well. It's just not going to be your fastest path to progress. You're going to be taking a couple exits, visiting the biggest dinosaur in the world. <laughs> so you, you guys have worked with over 15,000 people now. What are the most common challenges and situations you see that derail people from reaching their goals? So we're going to talk about like practical, legitimate challenges. So the biggest challenges I think is that resistance that you see from other people. So this is super strict. This is obsessive. This is crazy or you know you 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 need to live a little like that kind of thing pressure from other people who are are not following the same program as you that's super common especially if um the people in your household don't follow the same program as you like if you live in south louisiana and there's the best food on the planet and i mean it's hard yeah i've been i've been tracking my macros through mardi gras like it is it is super hard for sure um so that's a huge challenge i think that that's always going to be a challenge um, in terms of health and fitness, it's like making going on vacation and making the time to go to the gym. You're going to see similar resistance with that kind of thing. Um, in terms of other challenges, eating out at restaurants, just because there's discomfort in you know busting out your scale at the table. There's that's just not it's not a super normal thing to do. Um, so that managing how to track not to be on your phone constantly because it does it is a lot easier to track your macros when you're using an app Mm -hmm. so uh, not to be on your phone constantly that's three pretty big ones and what can people do to not let those derail them I think it's probably different for every single person and it depends on the specific kind of situation but the resistance from other people uh, we, Michael and I have worked with a relationship coach before and I love how she puts it, it has nothing to do with nutrition, but she talks about standing up for someone's greatness and doing something even though it makes them a little bit uncomfortable because you know it's what's right for you. And that's actually setting an example, which is giving them an opportunity to stand up for what's right for them. And while it might not seem that way in the moment, and it might seem like you know, you're just making them feel uncomfortable or like they're making you doubt yourself, but by you standing strong to what it is that you need for yourself or what you're achieving, you're now being this example of what's possible for them. And that doesn't necessarily mean tracking their macros, but it could translate to, you know, um, saying no in other scenarios when some when they're, someone at work asks them to do something they don't want to do or going to the gym or meditating whatever it is, it's going to make, show them that it is possible. Like someone just like them, someone that they're friends with, someone that they see all the time. It is possible to be confident and stick to what it is that you say you're going to do. And yeah, let me, let me see if I understand you correctly. So if I, if I just started 
flexible dieting and I need the support, I need your support, right? Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that I would kind of model that the co-commitment, like, right? Like if I know that you say that you want to get to the gym every day, I, and you all of a sudden like say, Oh, I'm not going to the gym one day. I model what I need from you by saying, no, you, you told me you were going to the gym, go to the gym. Right. And then that's not what I was saying. Okay. I wasn't saying, I'll clarify. That's, okay. I mean, that could be great too, set in the right context because mm-hmm. I think certain ways of saying that might be confrontational depending on who you're talking to. But right, you would you're yeah. very tactful. <laughs> yes, I was saying more like if someone's saying, are you really going to weigh and measure that? You'd be like, yeah, I am really going to weigh and measure this. I'm starting this new program. I'm really committed to doing it and it's really working well for me and I want to see, you know, I want to follow it so that I know it's the program working or the program not working. Like doing it anyways, even though someone's challenging you to not do it. Okay. Not, um, that doesn't involve a communication. So standing, standing up for yourself. Standing up for yourself. Okay. So like that standing up for yourself is also standing up for other people. So thinking, instead of thinking like, I need to make this person feel comfortable, it's actually potentially hindering them more than it is helping them. Mm-hmm. In that moment, it might be like a band-aid, oh, I'm going to make them feel a little bit better because I'm going to give up on what I want. It's going to make them feel a little bit better. Like, oh, we're going to be able to like eat pizza together. Mm-hmm. But actually in the long run, standing up for yourself and sticking to what it is that you want to do is standing up for them as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's inspiring and it's contagious, right? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't happen, it takes different amounts of time with different people, but if you stick to what you said you were gonna do and they, they can see that integrity you have with yourself, it starts to rub off on people. For sure. And it's, it's, it's a really great thing in a relationship. I've seen, I've seen that happen, not, I mean, it happens in all scenarios, not just nutrition, but in nutrition, I've seen people be like so uninterested in weighing and measuring. People say, oh, I can't believe that you're weighing that right now. That's totally crazy. And then two weeks later, ask me how to do it. Mm-hmm. Or like, can you tell me a little bit more about that? And it's funny because in the moment, they're like challenging you. Mm-hmm. Like it's a challenge and you don't have to be rude about it, but you can stick to, you know, stick to what it is that is right for you, regardless of how that's making them feel, because what they're saying has way more to do with them. Like that's what their stuff that's going mm-hmm. on has nothing to do with you. It's like, I couldn't possibly be making someone else feel bad because I'm following a nutrition program. Like that's, that's crazy talk, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you think about that, literally, I'm making you feel bad about yourself because I'm watching my nutrition. Like, I don't think that that's a normal thing. Right. What about the the restaurant one? Eating at restaurants, a couple, like, there's a million different strategies and it, I would work through all of them with anybody that we were working with. But one could be if you feel uncomfortable uh, tracking when you're actually at the restaurant, I would look up the menu beforehand and see if there's options. Also, uh, not being afraid to order, ask for changes to the menu, depending on what kind of restaurant you're at, but saying, you know, most restaurants have chicken breasts. So, you know, asking for some chicken breast or asking for some sauce on the side, asking for, you know, you want um, an Alfredo pasta, but they have a red sauce pasta on the menu. Ask if you can have that with the red sauce, like switching things around from different options on the menu. Um, And if you don't want to track at the table, then taking a picture of your food and maybe putting like your hand beside it for reference in terms of serving sizes. And you could be like, oh, I'm just taking this picture for Instagram. (laughs) And you take a picture of the food and you put, I like to put my hand beside it just because I use my fingers for reference for ounces and tablespoons and stuff like that. So using that picture later to be able to estimate to some capacity of what it is that I would put into my app. So I have like small sausage fingers how should i (laughs) how should i change those um i just want to highlight for a second like when you describe your company and what you guys do you use the words like you know create strategies and behavior change and all this stuff what we just talked about what you just talked about are those things and as simple as they seem like that is where the magic is those are the strategies for how you're going to fit this program to your lifestyle rather than trying to fit your lifestyle to a rigid program for sure for sure and it's 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 the there's like hundreds of different ones that we could use for restaurants and you could like in our program you could send your coach what restaurant you're going to and you could say hey i'm going to go to this on saturday can you Mm -hmm. look at the menu like give me some what you would order certain things like that we're supporting you through every step of the way and some people are just 
like, oh, that strategy couldn't work. Or maybe it's like a little uncomfortable to try to take a picture of your food at the restaurant, but it works. And it becomes the, the discomfort diminishes the second you do it one time. Like mm-hmm. once you do it one time, you've like crossed this door and you're like, I can never go back. Right. It's just not that uncomfortable. It always feels 10 times more uncomfortable than it actually is. I just want to mention one and then we'll move on just okay. because it was like a, an aha moment for me. Okay. And so, you know, I get so stressed out at dinner oh, because I yeah. won't like, I won't prepare at all and I'll, it'll be 7, 8 p.m. and then I'll be already starving and I have to count, like make sure I'm hitting my macros, I, you know, like play some Tetris, some, some macro Tetris. The, the aha moment for me was finally trying to just pre-program my dinner. Which right? is so simple. Exactly. Like, how simple is that? It's so simple. It's almost like, how was I so silly that I didn't do that beforehand? Mm-hmm. It's so simple. So, yeah. In the morning, I just wait. I, not wait it all out. I just planned exactly what I was going to eat. So, by dinner time, I already knew exactly what I was going to eat. There was no stress. I had a huge, like, high-volume meal that made me really full and it was delicious. And, like, having that experience made the, the whole you know, it just made flexible dieting so much more appealing to me. Yeah. And it's, it's totally different for everybody. Like I don't like to pre-program my dinner Mm -hmm. and you know that, like, I don't want to decide what I'm going to eat for dinner. I actually like going into the fridge and being like, Oh, I have this amount of protein or this amount of carbs. Like, what am I going to eat today? Like, I like that. So that's the crazy part about nutrition. And what we do is it really is totally about what works for you. And we're going to help you with some strategies that we know work for other people that are similar to you, but that doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Mm-hmm. It's just trial and error until you find that thing that that's the aha moment for you that you're going to take with you forever. Right. What role does mindset have in what you do? I think it has just as much to do with what we do as it does with everything in life. So the, the one of our favorite books is Mindset by Carol Dweck, and it talks about growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And having a, there's no, the, the main point I took from reading that book was that there's just no reason to not have a growth mindset in every single aspect of your life. Like there's just no reason not to, to have a fixed mindset in any capacity is only doing negative to you. Can you define those real quick? Right. So growth mindset would be, um, the mindset that you can be better at things that you, with hard work, with effort, with asking for help, um, you're going to improve your skills in whatever it is that, that you're working on. And that doesn't necessarily define how much you're going to improve or what it is that you're going to accomplish. It has less to do with the actual accomplishment itself, more to do with working really hard and getting better at something. And then a fixed mindset is I am not good at math or I am a certain way or you are a certain way, which means that there's no flexibility there. Mm -hmm. Like you can't get better at it. So that would be the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And thinking that anything is fixed is not helping you in any capacity like let's say that it is true let's say that there is some some somebody out there that's just can't be any smarter is it going to help them to believe that about them or is it going to help them to believe that about themselves there's no positive that that can do so might as well adopt a growth mindset and that directly translates to nutrition nutrition is frustrating the thing about nutrition is it happens every single day multiple times a day you don't go to the gym every single day multiple times a day, even if you're an, an Olympian. Mm-hmm. You don't go to the gym multiple times. You can get away from it. You can't get away from nutrition, and it not only encompasses the meals that you eat, it, it's the way you look in the mirror. It's the number on the scale. It's the way that you're feeling in your clothes. It's the way that your clothes are fitting you. It has so much to do. So to the mindset that you have when you approach nutrition and whether you have a fixed mindset and think that I'm just never going to get better at this or I'm just the the amount of times I've heard someone come to the program and say I'm just accepting that this is what my body's going to look like forever right I've had three kids and this is just my mom body and this is what I'm going to look like forever that acceptance of that mindset is inhibiting your growth immediately because it's not true. Mm-hmm. Like I've seen countless and countless times of people transforming their bodies 
regardless of how many kids they've had or and someone else doing it is just evidence that it's possible and it doesn't mean that you're going to look exactly like them but you can look more confident you can be more confident in the way that you look you can be happier with your body you can feel healthier and have more energy and have less stress which is automatically going to make you love your body more even if it looks exactly the same right I mean, I think people get really jaded after they've tried like nutrition program after nutrition program after nutrition program and, and, you know, it works for a little bit and then it doesn't and they think something like in their genetics is off or they have some kind of like hormonal imbalance and some people obviously do, but it's very few. It's very rare that that is the case and people jump to that because they just think like they, it just doesn't work for them, right? And that's just such Mm -hmm. a self-limiting belief. For sure, definitely. You're those people are in the minority. Mm-hmm. It's a smaller percentage. So based on statistics, you're more likely in the larger percentage. And then even so, even if you are that person, I'd rather want to know for sure that you are that person. But if you are, do you stop eating healthy? Do you stop exercising? Do you stop trying to get better at things? It's like, is that the decision that you make? I don't think that that's that's necessarily what is going to make you feel good mentally Mm -hmm. it might maybe maybe you maybe it might affect the level of change you can see in your body but how many people in the world have have broken those rules like why can't you be the person who breaks those rules right so we learned a very interesting concept at the landmark forum a month or so ago Mm -hmm. about knowing you know when we're talking about behavior change knowing the why you behave a certain way is it pales in comparison to the action that we take towards our actual goals. So can you explain that a little bit and how it relates to nutrition? Yeah, so it's hard when you think about it in the abstract. Uh, It's easier when you think about an actual scenario, Mm -hmm. but it's if you're trying to accomplish a certain goal and something sidetracks you, so you're on this road and you're heading towards the goal, and then all of a sudden you see the largest dinosaur in the world and he distracts you and you get off the road and now you're heading in a different direction, most people focus on what brought you off the road. And they focus on like, why did I get off the road? Or what's wrong with me? Or how can I fix this thing that took me off the road instead of taking an action that puts you back on the road heading towards your goal? And that's super abstract, but let me me use an example. example. An example, um, an example in terms, it wouldn't be nutrition, but a potent example is me going to the gym. So, I I want to go to the gym five times a week. That's what I want to do. I want to go to the gym to the CrossFit class five times a week. If I miss a CrossFit class, I immediately go to why didn't I go to the CrossFit class? Maybe I need to change my schedule. Maybe I need to schedule meetings at different times. Maybe I need to change the CrossFit class time that... Like, you know, that time doesn't work for me. Or maybe it's because Michael didn't come with me to the gym. And maybe I need to convince you to come with me to the gym. I'm focusing on what didn't get me to the gym. Mm -hmm. Like what is it that went wrong that didn't get me to the gym versus just go into the garage. We have a bunch of equipment. I can just do a workout. Right. Like I can just take action towards the goal of working out five times a week. Mm -hmm. And then the next day I can try and go to the CrossFit class. Mm -hmm. But focusing on the reasons why I didn't make it to the CrossFit class is not getting me to the CrossFit class. And it's not also getting me to work out five times a week. Right. It's the same thing with somebody with nutrition, you're going to the you, you have this goal of hitting your macros every day. And you go to the to the the closet and you see the peanut butter jar. And you, you're like, I'm just gonna have one spoonful of peanut butter. And now you're like, why did I have that one? Why did I break that? Um, like now it's like, oh screw it. I already had one. I might as well have five more and I'll start again tomorrow and focus on the, you know, what is it about peanut butter? Maybe I need to get rid of the peanut butter altogether, which for some people that might be true, but what's more potent is taking an action like putting the peanut butter away Mm -hmm. and going to eat a pepper that's higher volume or going to have um, a glass of water or going to make yourself dinner because you're just hungry and waiting for dinner or getting out of the kitchen altogether. Like all of those actions are gonna bring you closer to your goal of staying on your nutrition program versus focusing on why did I eat the peanut butter? Right. Why you ate the peanut butter might not be an act, like might not lead to an action that's gonna help you achieve your goal. Right, and understanding the why behind the way that you behave is not a bad thing as long as it's not getting in the way of action because sure. a lot of times it will lead to 
inaction because we'll sit there, ruminate, it will affect our emotions and our thoughts, and then we're then we're screwed. Yeah, right? you, we're completely derailed. You think I have to like totally understand the why in order to get back to action. Right. And that's not true. Like now you can you can succeed and accomplish things with having no idea how it happened. Mm-hmm. Like no idea why. You can go to you can go to CrossFit classes and achieve all of these PRs and all these things and not knowing what's going on in your body and what's making that happen. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people do know why that's happening, Mm -hmm. but you don't need that in order to uh, achieve your goals. Right. Okay, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. All right, we're back. We were just talking about the difference between taking action versus knowing Versus having to know why you're doing something and the importance of always just taking action um, regardless of whether you know why it happened or not. Can you explain next the A to B model? Yeah. And and how that relates to nutrition? I, I, I know I'm like, these are a bunch of little random like uh, models, but I think they're so useful to people. And, and, and if one, you know, if one of them, if only one of them helps someone have like a, an aha moment or it to click, then I think it would be yeah. successful. I mean, all of these things that you're talking about were both for you and for me, these like moments of clarity where we were like, wow, that's happening in so many different aspects of my life. And they were moments where we just broke through the next mindset. So that's why they're so powerful. And I hope I can do them justice and explain in the way that they were explained to us that it did so much for us Um, the a to b model is very similar that you're you know you're at a which is the start and then you're heading towards b which is your goal and it's like a funnel so b's at the bottom a's at the top there's a funnel going all the way to b so it gets narrower when you get to b so at a there's all this room it's super wide the top of the funnel is super wide right so the top of the funnel is super wide and you have what we call the zone of optimal behavior. So the optimal behavior can be, you can do a bunch of different things at the top of the funnel and you're still going to be headed towards B. The closer you get to B, the funnel gets narrower and the types of behaviors that you can do to still continue to make progress towards B become less, fewer, narrower. So an an example that was presented to us that has literally nothing to do with nutrition is in terms of basketball. So if your goal is to qualify for the NBA, you start at A, you're a young kid just learning how to play, just playing with the ball. And you can be headed in the right direction. You're just moving in the right direction. And that's totally okay. You're still making progress towards qualifying for the NBA. Then you have to learn what offense is versus defense. Then you go to high school and you have to actually go to practice. Now it's not okay to just move in the right direction. That's not okay anymore. Now it gets narrower, so you have to go to practice. Then you know you maybe you get to the end of high school, you have to start actually exercising. You have to go to the weight room. So it's not good enough to just practice and play basketball. Now you have to work on your skills outside. You have to work on your strength. You have to work on your agility. You got to work on your speed. Then you get out of high school, you go to college. You got to get a certain grade point average. It matters what your grades are in school. So the, the level of the, the zones of behavior gets narrower and narrower. What's acceptable is narrower and narrower. The things that used to be acceptable are not acceptable anymore, and they also won't help you progress towards your goals. And then finally, once you qualify for the MBA, it's so narrow that like your personal life comes into question. You know, you can't get a DUI, you can get kicked off your team, you are in the public eye, you're gonna have to do press conferences, you so all these different things come into play. And the most important parts of the A to B model is that if you're outside of that acceptable behavior, you are now at what we call a choice point. So you have a choice. You either get back into the zone of acceptable behavior and you stop doing that thing that doesn't fit anymore in the funnel, or you leave and you abandon the goal altogether. Both of those are very valid options. Some people go to high school and they don't go to college ball. That's a choice point. They don't, they don't qualify for the next step. Uh, and that's your choice point. And the thing that is the most important is that if you still want to head towards B, most people, they get to a choice point and they're like, oh, this is hard. Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to go into the zone of acceptable behavior. Oh no, like that's really hard. It's uncomfortable. It's difficult. What they want to do is they want to go back to A. 
they want to go back to just moving in the, in the in any direction or just doing offense and defense. But A is gone. Like, it's not an option anymore. You can't go backwards. You can only move forwards. So you really just have your choice. Mm -hmm. And that's the same with nutrition, where at the beginning of a weight loss journey, let's say we're just talking weight loss, it would be the same with weight gain or anything. But at the beginning, you can just pay attention to the food you're eating and lose weight. Like, just the mere awareness of what you're eating is going to facilitate some progress. But then eventually that's not acceptable anymore. So now you have to actually be more precise in terms of what macros you're eating. And if you want to get all the way to B, which is losing 30 pounds, everyone wonders why are the last five pounds the hardest to lose? It's because it's the narrowest level of acceptable behavior. All of those things that don't fit into the zone of acceptable behavior are not going to lead you towards B. You have to tighten things up if you want to get all the way to that goal. So the more you think this is accurate, the more, I don't know, extreme your goal is, the bigger your goal is, the tighter that, that, that end of that funnel is going to be? I think at any goal, it's going to be the tightest at the end of the funnel. Mm-hmm. It's just like, it, it depends on who you ask as to, right. as to what would be constitute as a like tighter, more restricting or right. I think it would be different for different people. The people that make it to the NBA maybe don't see it as that big of a deal. Whereas like we see it as a serious big deal. So what do you mean when you say that a system is only as good as it works in the hardest scenario? So I, I, I I love, I took this from John Berardi on your podcast. So John Berardi was on the Brute Shank podcast and he said something very similar to that. Like your system is only good as what you could follow in the most difficult scenario. Mm -hmm. And that means that if life needs to completely align in order for you to follow your program, then it's not the right program for you. So if you if you can't follow your weightlifting program unless you're in this weightlifting gym with this coach, with these shoes, and you're and you travel all the time, it's not the right program for you. So then if if you're not in at home in the in the city where this gym is, then you just don't exercise at all, then that can't be the right program for you to be the healthiest version of yourself. So you have to find a program that is something that you can follow even when life is difficult, when work is really stressful, when you're traveling, when you're eating out at restaurants, when you're hanging out with friends that don't necessarily care about their nutrition and their fitness. Uh, Those are going to be the most successful programs. So the system is only as good as it can work in those scenarios Mm -hmm. for you. I love the quote, something to the effect, the good program you follow is better than the perfect one you don't. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us are guilty at some point in our lives uh, for looking for that perfect, like magic bullet, that perfect thing that, that, you know, we want to follow the most intense thing. We think like we are that, that super disciplined person that's going to follow this to a T and so few of us are, right? right? It takes a very, very intense person to follow those, those very, very strict and they, and what, those people those people can only follow it for a particular period of their life. Right. They don't follow it for their entire lives. And it's either that or it's like someday syndrome. Mm-hmm. Like I'm going to be fit when I could be home and go to this this one gym with this one coach. That's when I'm going to get fit again. Right. Or I'm going to get back on my nutrition program when I'm not traveling. I, and we've all done that. Like everyone's done that. Oh, I'm going to get back into my eating tomorrow. Right. The someday. Someday is never coming. It's never coming. Just do it. Take an action now. If you haven't listened to our last podcast together, definitely go check that out. We talked about consistency, accuracy, and what was it? The third one. The, th- the three things. Compliance. And compliance, consistency, accuracy, oh. and compliance. And um, how you, whatever goal you have, um, basically making sure that your, your expectations. expectations meet your, the goals that you have mm-hmm. really, really fascinating stuff. So go check that out. So I wanted to switch gears for a second before we finish it up. Um, you want to click back? I don't know if that's affecting anything. Oh, it's okay. Um, so what was I going to say? Okay. So you've built this company that has over 20 coaches now. And I mean, when it started, it was just you giving a ton of care and attention to every single one of your members. Now you have over 20 coaches and the goal is to provide every single client with the same exact service. How have you done that? How have you, what, you know, how have you built a system that can, can replicate you giving that individual care to every single person? 
I really think that it's a constant work in progress. I don't think that we have the perfect way of doing that, but the way that we do that is by um, keeping uh, communication with our coaches. So we have meetings with each other. We uh, encourage people to be open about the things that are going on with their clients so we can facilitate discussions together. We can work through certain scenarios. We could share all of our experiences to help everybody. And that would include me contributing as well to, you know, if someone coaches, hey, I have this client who's going through X, Y, Z, what would you guys do? I've, I've tried X, like Q scenarios. Mm-hmm. What would you do? Uh, like recommend so doing that as well um, I mean we're constantly trying to do this better and better but tracking certain um, metrics to see you know are people actually happy whether it's surveys or collecting feedback from clients like I'll personally reach out to clients and email them and say hey how are things going I uh, if a client calls me and they're upset I'm gonna follow up with them two weeks later and say hey how are things going I'm gonna talk to those coaches we also have Um, a head coach who uh, does continued education for all of the coaches as well as goes through their responses and reads those communications and provides feedback. Uh, I think it's a constant work in progress. We're in a new software. So all of the program is housed in this one software. So I think it's going to make it a lot easier for us to pull certain certain, uh, indicators or certain metrics that will show us, you know, we, we have now capabilities to do like hey, was this check-in useful for you? Thumbs up, thumbs middle, thumbs down. Like whether it's something like that or popping up little surveys or just um, checking on response time of coaches. We, we know if, some, if a coach missed the 24-hour rule, which is a rule that we have that every response, every communication is responded to within 20 hours, 24 hours, we are notified. So I know if that's not happening. So things like that. I think advances in tech and just getting better at creating a community internally is is helping with that for sure and it's it's going to it's going to always be a struggle especially since all of the coaches live all over the world and we're not all in one place and they really do have autonomy but they're awesome people and it's really hard to be a, become a member of the team wag team uh, they go through a pretty rigorous training process and selection process. So I know every single one of them is super passionate about what they do. They love their clients and are devastated if any of them are upset or are not seeing progress and really are there to help them reach their goals for sure. So you're 27 and as of about three years ago, you hadn't even read your first business book. Right. Um, what are some of the principles that you followed or, or that have played a huge role in your life in the past few years that have led to your success? I think that the biggest game changer for me was going to the Barbell Shrug Mastermind. Like I really do think that that was the biggest. I don't think before I went to meet Barbell Shrugged mm-hmm. and got advice from them, I realized how important it was to get advice from people that have been there before. Uh, And I think that being there for three days and immersed in in what they were doing and the advice that they were giving and realizing how much I didn't know, Mm -hmm. like that there was so much that I didn't know that I didn't know. And I thought I was killing it. Mm -hmm. And I see, I'm like, wow, I am not killing it. Like I have so much growth and so much potential. And realizing that I could ask for help and that they're even if someone out there is not doing exactly what I'm doing, their advice is still valuable and I can take what serves me and use that and implement it and you know maybe tuck the other stuff away or mm-hmm. try different things and if it works, go with it and if it doesn't, cut it. But uh, asking for help and being part of other entrepreneurial um, groups and being part of other entrepreneurs lives and asking them questions and being vulnerable and telling them what I've got going on uh, has has I think it's like one of the biggest reasons why we're successful yeah I couldn't agree more and you know that was doing that mastermind the one in uh, I think it was 2014 summer of 2014 uh, after I had stopped competing going to that first their very first mastermind like completely blew my mind Mm -hmm. Um, I had not a damn clue about what I was gonna do and I walked away from that that mastermind feeling like I had a a decent plan and I had some strategies of how to how to you know run a company and it it was it was you know I've always I've never had a hard time asking for help but it it suddenly showed me like 
how important it is to reach out, spend time with, ask questions of those that are exactly where you want to be. Right. I mean, and it, th- yeah, they're exactly where you want to be. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't have to be like exactly the right fit, like the mm-hmm. exact same fit. And the thing that I love the most is nobody creates this, nobody gets successful without having some type of strategy or having some type of lessons that they've learned. And if they're being successful from what it is that they're telling you, like the lesson that they learned, it's not just like an arbitrary system that they've created. Mm -hmm. Nobody just creates this program or this arbitrary pattern that doesn't work. So if you follow it, just like nutrition, if you actually follow it, you're going to see some type of progress or you're going to lead somewhere. It might not be the right one for you, but it's going to teach you something. Mm -hmm. So I think I learned from there. If that person's doing it and they're seeing that much success from doing it, I'm just going to copy them and I'm going to do the exact same thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that, that there's so much abundance out there. We could all copy each other, especially if you're doing good stuff. Like Mm -hmm. you don't have to be super creative and original. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you've taught me so much is, is, you know, kind of like everyone listening to this, like that's interested in fitness knows like in the gym, we all, we want to improve every single day in every aspect, right? Mm-hmm. In business, it's the same exact way. We can never become complacent, and every single part of our business has to improve, or we're or we're or it's gonna deteriorate, right? And you've really showed me that through the way that you run Wag. Thanks. Thanks. Um, you talk a lot about the fact that we're more defined by what we say no to than what we say yes to. Mm-hmm. What are What are one or two of the biggest things that you've said no to that have most defined where you are today? Oh, I've said no to offering anything other than nutrition (laughs) programming. I think that that's contributed to our success, Mm -hmm. like focusing on the one thing that we do really well and saying no to all of the other things. Um, I've said no to... I want to stop right there real quick because it's it's interesting. It's kind of like a, a paradox because a second ago you were talking about like, you know, looking at people that are where you are, but really a lot of really smart, successful people told you early on to start offering like templates or, or just cheaper versions of what you do. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought it was like, it was so just so fucking cool that you, you've always stuck to what, what you want to do. And you said like, we offer one thing and we want to be the best in the world at it. And I don't care how much money I can make selling this other thing. Cause I want to be the best in the world at this thing. Right. I mean, if we were in this just to make money, we chose the wrong industry. I mean, it's, it's, it's not about just making money. It's about giving people the best service that we possibly can or helping people transform their lives in the most sustainable way possible. And do I think that we're perfect at it? Not even close, but I think that we've helped so many people. And if we were focused on, you know, maybe we would have created some type of cheaper version that um, didn't have as much support. And we didn't, we put some energies towards there. And we didn't have all this energy put towards giving people this one-on-one service that's totally individualized and that really cares about them and creates this way of tracking in and measuring in and all this kind of stuff, then maybe it wouldn't have been as good. And maybe we would have had people that needed the one-on-one that would have opted for the more cheaper version. Right. And then they would have missed out on this transformation that they had. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know how many people that would have happened to, but I think a lot of it too comes from... I, I like just focusing on one thing. I don't, I, I feel com- comfort in knowing that there's this one thing that we're working on. We have this one goal and it's easier to uh, make progress for me that way. Right. And I, I'm not sure if I said it or not, but I hope I said at some point we're more defined. But at the beginning, I want to be clear about this for listeners. At the beginning, when you're first starting out in anything, you kind of got to say yes to everything. Right, you got to say yes to opportunities to to grow, to learn, to connect with people. But at a certain point, once you decide what it is you actually want to do, then in order to achieve a you know a, a goal greater than yourself, you have to you can't take every tangent because you're just not. No one can do a million things at once. Well, very I mean, well. if you start taking all the tangents, you're spending more time on the tangents than you are on the thing that you actually want to do. Right. 
that like can start taking up all your time. Like whether it's, you know, sponsorship opportunities or starting a supplement company. I mean, people have come to us asking if we can create a clothing brand with them, but I really just want to focus on this. I really want all of our energies to be giving our members that we have, like the ones that we have, the best that we have. Like I can confidently say that we are trying our hardest and we put our absolute hearts and souls into what we do and this it's going to keep getting better and better but we are every single day trying to give the best service that we possibly can if otis became overweight <laughs> would you consider like, otis a, is like our a dog. flexible dieting for dogs no he's a dog <laughs> i guess we just deal with that internally <laughs> All right, my last question is, what is one thing that you've done in the past six months to a year that's made you happier? Well, I got a dog. That's made me happier, for sure. Uh, the dog has definitely helped. Why? Uh, it's like, it. we've talked about this recently, but it's like caring about something else and that he needs me. Like, he needs me to feed him, mm-hmm. and he needs me to walk him, and he needs me to make sure he's okay. It kind of, like, gets me out of my own space for a little bit. Like, I can't be worrying about my own stuff when, you know, the dog, like, had an accident in the crate. Like, I need to make sure that he's clean, and I need to make sure that, you know, we're training him properly, and that that's not going to happen again. Or, you know, he needs to go take a walk, or he needs to eat. I need to make sure I'm home. So it kind of, like puts me thinking about him it's kind of like doing service like volunteering somewhere exactly. it takes you out of your own space and it helps you get perspective like my i'm not like the world doesn't revolve around me mm-hmm. like it's not a d's universe and nothing else exists like he just looks at me and he's like can you play with me right now yeah. <laughs> and it's made me way happier for sure that's so cool i think it's it's really a simple, and, and you're right, it's like serving others. Mm-hmm. And it can it doesn't have to be like going and volunteering at a soup kitchen or with homeless or anything like that. Although it can Which be. Which is cool. Right? Although <laughs> it can be. It can be as simple as just asking someone how their day is and, and really, really listening and potentially like asking further questions if, if, if something's really on their mind, right? Yeah. That, that can be a simple way to get out of your own head, feeling sorry for yourself or whatever it is that you're going through. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Anything else you want to add? Um, no, I don't think so. No? Um, any like cool new initiatives that are going on at WAG that you want people to know about or any place you want to point them to? Um, well, you can sign up for Working Against Gravity. Our wait list is open. We brought on three new coaches last month, so we have some availability. Uh, it's our first time in, I think, two years that we've had like a consistent open wait list, which is really exciting, and it gives us the opportunity to do a bunch of new things. Um, as well as new initiatives, we have a brand new software that's called Seismic, for those of you that don't know it, uh, which basically houses the entire software and now we brought on a new developer who's going to put out some pretty crazy awesome new features in there of ways for you to visualize your progress better ways for you to communicate with your coach making it more accessible so you don't have to deal with attachments and emails and attaching jpeg files or you know getting alerts of like when it is to remind you to check in with your coach or um, new things coming out in the future that uh, are just going to make it more engaging and a lot easier for you to remember your goals, mm-hmm. stick to them, and... I, yeah. I think of it basically like, you know, one of, maybe the best way to lose weight is to hire you and have you live with me at all times, or obviously you live with me, but if someone <laughs> can hire you and you can be with them at all times, mm-hmm. this basically puts that in their pockets, right? They have reminders, they have motivation. It's like the most the easiest way to track ever. It's amazing. And uh, yeah, so we just finished a huge, uh, for those tech dudes out there, a huge code migration to a new platform that allows us to uh, improve the coding in a much more uh, safe and scalable fashion. That, That took two and a half months. So we had two and a half months of almost no new features to our software. And that just ended. So the next couple months are gonna be huge i'm really excited to see uh, all of our new features come to fruition hell yeah and then they can find you at the cashew Mm -hmm. and uh, at working against gravity where we have a bunch of instagram takeovers a bunch of new recipes all that starting to uh, 
get a little bit more professional too. I mean, we're becoming an actual company. <laughs> <laughs> and if you haven't checked it out already, um, WAG is putting out a really cool series on Catherine, Catherine. David's daughter. Mm-hmm. You can look that up on YouTube, type in Team WAG, know, Team WAG Catherine. Yeah. And it comes and out on epic. Friday. So part three comes out this Friday. Part four is going to come out next Friday. It's a four part series on exactly why Katrin is the two time fittest woman on earth. And she's incredible. So hell yeah. Alrighty. Thank you. Thanks.